a bargain bin future. Welcome to Ms. Mojo, and today we're counting down our picks for the top 10 YA adaptations that flopped. For this list, we'll be looking at movies based on YA novels that, for one reason or another, failed to meet expectations at the box office. These are not the worst films, some might even be or become called classics, but they flopped commercially. Well, thank you for your advice. If you like what you're hearing, be sure to check out the full song at the link below. Number 10. Inkheart Based on the first book in a trilogy by Cornelia Funke, Inkheart was a family-friendly fantasy film that just kind of came and went. While by no means awful, the film is too rushed and messy to allow most of its characters or core ideas to develop, causing most of the novel's magic to be squandered in the process. Inkheart. It's a good read. Full of adventure and magic. And creature caught the shadow. Terrifying. I read several chapters aloud and nothing happened. Along with getting little more than a shrug from critics, Inkheart performed poorly at the box office, especially in the United States and the United Kingdom, putting to an end any hope that the full trilogy might be adapted. It's a good story, I'll give you that. Silver Tongues is a wonderful concept, I wish I'd thought of it, but it's too absurd to take seriously. I know my characters are so believable that they seem to leap off the page, but it's simply not possible. Number 9. The Indian in the Cupboard just because a film bombs at the box office does not mean it is terrible, and 1995's The Indian in the Cupboard is a prime example. I won't hurt you. This is magic? I guess. Directed by Frank Oz of Yoda and Dirty Rotten Scoundrels fame, The Indian in the Cupboard did a reasonably decent job of adapting Lynn Reed Banks' 1980 fantasy novel about a cupboard that brings toys to life. I will heal when I have another child. Little children are the sun and the moon and the stars. While the critical response was generally passable, The Indian in the Cupboard failed to even crack the top five at the U.S. box office and lasted only five weeks before dropping out of the top 20. Great spirit. Yes, little bear. Tell me about the Onondaga guy. Are we always the great people? Number eight, The Seeker, The Dark is Rising. Based on the second book in Susan Cooper's The Dark is Rising series, which concluded in 1973, The Seeker was not worth the long wait for a film adaptation. Discretion, man. There is a right way to do things. And a way of getting them done. Inspired by legends of old, The Seeker is fundamentally a classic tale about the eternal conflict between the warriors of light and dark. We, the old ones, we serve the light. The rider, he serves the dark. The darkest rising room. It is you who must restore the power of the light. Devoid of much of the book's mythical undertones, epicness, or ambiguity, though, the movie came across as just another uninspired fantasy film in a post Harry Potter world. The Seeker bombed so badly at the box office, it was pretty much dead on arrival. Don't open the door! Number 7. Vampire Academy While divisive, Twilight proved that vampires and YA novels can produce box office gold. On the other hand, Vampire Academy suggested that maybe Twilight was just an exception. You know, ever since that night, I still can't get used to it. You being in my head, it's so weird. You should know by now, with us, weird doesn't begin to cover it. Despite occasionally poking fun at YA tropes, this adaptation of Rochelle Mead's bestseller also firmly sticks to the genre's conventions, resulting in a film that often feels confused. After more than a decade of Harry Potter, Twilight, and Percy Jackson films, the YA craze had begun to slow down by 2014, and Vampire Academy felt tired before it even hit cinemas. Oh my god, you poor little... All this time me thinking that you're a villain when you're really just... You're just an insecure little girl in desperate need of attention. Ah! Everyone 
saw that I tried to take the high road there. Even on a relatively modest budget for the genre, Vampire Academy did not even come close to breaking even. And once again, this grotesque maelstrom of indecency seems centered on one royal individual. Number six, The Darkest Minds. Superpowered teens, a dystopian future, and a resistance group taking on a controlling government. These plot elements are synonymous with the YA genre, so The Darkest Minds combining all three hardly felt fresh. It was the beginning. The government wasn't scared of what happened to the dead kids or the empty spaces that they would leave behind. They were afraid of us, the ones who lived. Soon, there wouldn't be any kids anywhere. By 2018, it had already been a couple of years since the YA hype train had lost steam which might explain why the film adaptation of Alexandra Bracken's 2012 novel only debuted at number eight at the U.S. box office. Do you think that we've survived this by following the rules? Look, we're not just a bunch of dead weight. It ranked just below Ant-Man and the Wasp, which had been out for more than a month and was showing in fewer theaters than The Darkest Minds by that point. You're what, 16? You should know better than to work for the League. Oh, before we change our minds. Number five, the Divergent series, Allegiant. Usually, YA adaptations that bomb at the box office are new cinematic properties. Even if based on a popular series of novels, there's always an element of uncertainty. There's a net at the bottom. Don't think, just jump. While never reaching Hunger Games levels of success, the first two Divergent movies performed well enough to justify splitting Veronica Roth's last novel into two films, and allocating the franchise's biggest budget to the first part. We believe it is the only way to recover the humanity we have lost. Allegiant not only struck out badly with critics, but it also earned nearly $100 million less than its predecessor. Allegiant flopped so badly that any plans for a final entry were squashed, and the film franchise was left incomplete. Watch and learn. Stop right there! Drop your weapons! Hey, hey, Wolf! Hey, what are you doing? Put me down! Ah, ah! Number four, Ella Enchanted. As charming as Anne Hathaway can be, the actress's presence did not do much to help Ella Enchanted, very loosely based on Gail Carson Levine's retelling of Cinderella. And these must be your lovely daughters. My precious Hattie and my special Olive. Oh, and you must be Ella. A twist on classic fairy tales that centers around a princess who's given the so-called gift of obedience, Miramax's Ella Enchanted is a serviceable family-friendly flick that could have used a bit of Disney-esque marketing magic to fill the theaters. Go get down no. with the prince. No, I can't go! Well. Not dressed like that. No! Now that's what I'm talking about. Okay, that hurt. Peaking at number eight at the US box office and performing abysmally in most foreign markets, Ella Enchanted was wildly ignored upon release, and the passage of time has done the film little in the way of favors. Number three, Alex Ryder, Stormbreaker. A teenage James Bond sounds like a great idea on paper, which is exactly where Stormbreaker should have remained. Michael, he's never gonna set the world on fire because he's got a real boring job. Intruder alert! Stormbreaker was meant to launch a new blockbuster franchise that could potentially last decades, especially since Anthony Horowitz's novels had already reached book six by the time the film was released. Really? Oh, come on, when did I ever let you down? Do you really want me to answer that? <laughs> yeah, I know. After Alex Ryder failed to impress critics or bring in the crowds in the UK, the primary market for the novels, Stormbreaker was quietly released in the US before being swept under the rug. You don't belong to the same world as me. You should forget about me. Never forget you. While the number of novels reached double figures, Alex Ryder's film career remained a one-off flop. 
Number 2. City of Ember With a cast featuring the likes of Saoirse Ronan, Tim Robbins, and Bill Murray in a rare villainous turn, City of Ember should have been at least a moderate hit. Yes. What? Yes. <laughs> Thanks. Any hope the film might have had was dashed by a limited theatrical run, poor marketing, and lukewarm reviews. What was that? Based on Jean Dupro's novel of the same name, City of Ember didn't even crack the top 10 in the US and did not perform much better at the international box office. The film's stunning visual style, likable protagonist, and the source material's healthy reputation were not enough to save City of Ember from box office hell. I love my city and everyone in it. And I would never think to do such a thing. Before we continue, be sure to subscribe to our channel and ring the bell to get notified about our latest videos. You have the option to be notified for occasional videos or all of them. If you're on your phone, make sure you go into your settings and switch on notifications. Number 1. A Wrinkle in Time When the combined might of the Disney promotion machine and Oprah cannot get a movie out of the red, then nothing could have saved it. Oh, I didn't know. Based on Madeleine Langle's 1962 novel, A Wrinkle in Time boasts gorgeous visuals, some fine performances, and even one especially touching moment. Meg. <laughs> Meg. Yes. Despite some positives, the film drew a mixed critical reception and fell short of expectations in most areas. I mean, we've been looking for him. Can you take us to him? Yeah, yeah. Well, no, 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 no. Yeah, almost. He should be done working pretty soon. Commercially, A Wrinkle in Time underperformed in the US and struggled even worse internationally, and ultimately failed to recoup more than $100 million of its budget. All those who are willing to face the darkness and bring the best of themselves to the light. Do you agree with our picks? Let us know in the comments. And hey, if you're a fan of the song playing right now, be sure to check out the music video for it right here.